today on the Tearsheet Podcast. Uh, AI can be successfully applied to solve uh, problems in, in consumer lending to uh, sort of get the dr- fairly dramatic gains that um, we thought were possible um, in terms of how many people you could approve at the same loss rates or conversely, how much you could reduce loss rates uh, without uh, impacting risk, um, or sorry, without impacting approvals. Um, And to give you a sense of that, you know, what we've seen is compared to traditional bank models, um, we can reduce loss rates by about 75% approving the same number of people. Um, And that, that, um, if you think about that, that's just a mind boggling change in the economics of the business. Welcome to the Tearsheet Podcast. I'm Zach Miller. Artificial intelligence and finance has long been overhyped, but AI is making an impact in lending decisions. Online lender Upstart exemplifies how this set of technologies can expand lenders' inclusiveness without necessarily taking on any more risk. Paul Gu, a co-founder at Upstart, joins us on the podcast to talk about his firm's AI-powered credit decisioning API that lets banks and other lenders deliver instant credit decisions for auto, personal, and student loans. We discuss Upstart's performance during COVID as well. Paul Gu is my guest today on the Tearsheet Podcast. What could you do with better real-time consumer data? All data aggregation from Fiserv enables access to consumer permission data from over 18,000 sources. Lenders, advisors, fintech firms, and financial institutions can turn this data into actionable insight for their customers. Go to Fiserv.com slash all data to learn more. My name is Paul Gu. I'm one of the co-founders at Upstart. We're an online lending platform. We build technology that enables banks to use uh, AI in uh, in underwriting and originating consumer loans of all varieties. Um, uh, My quick uh, background um, is in uh, in computer science and, and economics. I spent some time in the world of algorithmic finance and wanted to find uh, about eight, almost nine years ago, I was thinking about finding applications of that to real consumer problems of importance and ended up um, finding my way to uh, this world of consumer lending, where we saw that there were huge inefficiencies, um, many people not being approved who should, being, uh, who should be approved for credit, uh, getting overcharged for credit. And if you sort of applied the latest technologies uh, available in uh, in, in modeling and in prediction uh, to this problem uh, that you could generate some some huge gains. So um, that's what I work on at uh, at Upstart. Interesting. And so, Paul, if we can just go back a few years, right, say eight or nine years when you guys started Upstart, um, how, how has AI evolved, I guess, in that time period to be able to deliver on that original vision that you had? Yeah, I mean, to, you know, to be honest, I think we've really had the tailwinds behind us in the sense that there's uh, a rapid pace of innovation in uh, in AI and ML technologies um, over the last decade. Um, some of that's just frankly been been powered by uh, sort of basic innovations in uh, in sort of the amount of compute that's available. Um, it's sort of getting uh, more easily available through uh, the cloud technologies, um, more sort of cheaply available, um, and uh, and then some of the uh, sort of mathematical uh, kind of uh, work that underpins it has been advancing as well. So we're, we're big consumers of academic literature that um, sort of uh, demonstrates new ways uh, to, to do things. For example, um, sort of a lot of the recent work on how to make models uh, more explainable um, has been really important to our work since we are consumer facing um, and we have sort of a large um, interaction with regulators. Um, uh, but but for sure, I think there's there's a huge amount of basic research um, and then sort of a more applied layer of research uh, that has been pushing a uh, sort of field of AI forward that has made it um, a great time for us to be in this. And, and what about um, on the other side, on, on the banking side, how about their willingness and openness to work with AI? How has that evolved? Yeah, I think, you know, it's still very early stages. Um, uh, I think traditionally uh, banks have, you know, not necessarily wanted to be on the cutting edge of, of new technologies, mostly because uh, they're sort of understandably risk averse um, about how those might be perceived by whether it's regulators or, or consumers, media, um, or, or just sort of the fundamental sort of economic risks. And so um, the way we built this business very much has been um, sort of starting out as almost an R&D lab, proving uh, some of these technologies out um, 
uh, in more limited settings, uh, sort of in the earlier stages of the business, you know, putting more of our own capital at risk to uh, really prove to the world that uh, AI can be successfully applied to solve uh, problems in, in consumer lending to uh, sort of get the tr fairly dramatic gains that um, we thought were possible um, in terms of how many people you could approve at the same loss rates or conversely, how much you could reduce loss rates uh, without uh, impacting risk, um, or sorry, without impacting approvals. Um, and to give you a sense of that, you know, what we've seen is compared to traditional bank models, um, we can reduce loss rates by about 75% approving the same number of people. Um, and that, that um, if you think about that, that's just a mind boggling change in the economics of the business. But of course, you know, the way we, uh, ultimately encourage our bank partners to apply that is not just to reduce the losses and, and thereby sort of improve uh, their own profit margins, but actually be able to expand the, the pool of uh, people that can be approved. Because the other way you can apply that, of course, is to say, well, let me, you know, I'm already okay with the, the level of loss rates that I have. Um, uh, let's expand the pool of people that we can improve. And, and on that front, you can more than double the number of people that you can improve in, in, in many cases. So um, so, so that's, you know, creates a really strong value prop to banks, um, but uh, the claims are so big that you needed to prove those out. And so we spent the first few years of the business uh, really demonstrating that. Um, we've, uh, we had really uh, exceptional performance on loans originated through the Upstart platform. Um, again, doing that initially with some of our own capital, then sort of gradually expanding into sort of other channels and source funding capital markets, warehouses, ABS deals. Um, and, uh, and in more recent years, you know, with the really strong proof points in hand, we've been uh, getting more and more banks sort of directly um, adopting the technology onto their, um, onto their balance sheets and in their uh, loan programs. And now a word from our sponsor. At Tearsheet's day-to-day -day conference, Fiserv's Paul Diegelman drilled down into the future of personal financial management. Paul, you're talking about PFM 2.0. It's actually two separate and distinct applications. Liquidity is a huge problem right now. Just people just don't have time to do things twice. Basically, most parts of the country shut down for COVID. Our PFM user growth was over 20% in the first two weeks alone. Underrated 100%. How could we use AI to impact PFM? I'm up for anything that helps people. And to help people, you need an economic model. And how have um, upstart models performed uh, during the coronavirus? I assume, you know, that wasn't necessarily modeled for, uh, certainly nobody had that in their plans in 2020. How, how did, how did, how are you guys faring during, during this market? Yeah, great question. Um, we've actually, um, you know, we've been really proud of, of the way that uh, the, the sort of model and loans uh, and, and whole program uh, have uh, performed and, and held up during this during this crisis. Um, I think you know, at the, if you were to ask us at the start of 2020, um, and, and plenty of people did. I mean, it's probably one of the most common questions we got, being a business that you know was founded in 2012 and um, uh, and you know uh, was lending through 2020. It was sort of one of the most um, benign period, benign uh, really decades that you could have been lending in. And so naturally, we. Uh, got the question a lot about how uh, how we would hold up uh, during a recession and whether somehow what we were doing was sort of like only a thing that would work during good times. Um, and you know, our point of view was always a, a few a few things. The first was that really um, I think lenders spend too much time uh, trying to forecast macro when when they really shouldn't be in that business. Um, sort of forecasting macro is a really hard thing, um, and. Uh, and that's really not the expertise that we have or that any, any lender has. Um, and that's sort of a whole different kind of business. You really should be agnostic on that front, which is to say, um, you know that once in a while there are recessions, but you don't know that what, when exactly it's gonna be or the cause. Um, and you shouldn't try to sort of build your business on that basis. Um, the second uh, point of view we had was that traditional prime um, is sort of you know this idea that people would say, well, if you're afraid of, a recession, then what you should do is you should only lend to people with higher uh, credit scores. And, and that just was not supported at all in the data. Um, and, and, and so we just uh, sort of always, uh, I think, repeatedly uh, held to the philosophy that it, even if you think a recession is coming soon, it's not a useful response to retreat to people with higher credit scores. That's not going to save you. Um, and then the third uh, and probably most important point of view we had on all of this is that whether there's a recession or not, 
the most important thing you can do to manage risk is get better at individual risk assessment, not the macro uh, risk assessment. Uh, because when you actually look at the data, individual risk variation trumps macro risk variation uh, enormously in consumer lending. And so we get to COVID. Um, and, uh, you know, I think fortunately for us, it's, it's been an almost perfect illustration of that philosophy. Of course, as you noted, no one expected the timing or cause of this crisis. Um, and when you look at the sort of actual performance numbers that, that we've seen, um, you know, I'll give you a couple of, of, of basic stats to sort of illustrate the point. The first is um, when you look at how predictive was upstart scoring of loans versus a sort of traditional credit scoring like the FICO score. Um, uh, of uh, performance during the pandemic. And we see that um, the upstart scoring was five times as, as predictive as uh, traditional FICO. Uh, wow. What that means is the latter is giving you fairly minimal risk separation. That means that if you're looking at measures of things like hardship rates or sort of uh, elevated delinquency rates, uh, those me measures were not very separate. They were a little bit separated between people with high FICO scores and low FICO scores, but people all across the credit score distribution were getting impacted by COVID. Um, when you look at the same thing by upstart uh, risk scoring bands, uh, what you, you, get a, you get a risk spread that's about five times larger, which means that your, your risk was sort of properly separated, which is what you want as a lender. When you look at the results in aggregate for our platform, meaning all loans originated um, through the upstart uh, system, um, sort of across all banks, um, we, we ended up, um, you know, sort of in the, in the peak of the crisis at the end of May, having a 5.8% uh, rate of hardships, which was sort of the principal way that uh, sort of most lenders experienced uh, the, the crisis because we all sort of created hardship programs for uh, the borrowers. And um, you could sort of see how many of your borrowers were entering this negative sort of credit status um, uh, by, by measuring that rate. We saw 5.8% hardship rate. That's almost 50% less than industry benchmarks. Um, and you can find those in uh, sort of a number of, of publications. Um, so uh, I guess all that is to say, um, we certainly were negatively impacted uh, by, by COVID uh, just because you know, we are aligned with our consumers at the end of the day. And if consumers are suffering, then, then we will as well. Um, but if you compare the uh, amount of increased uh, risk, delinquencies, defaults, hardships, et cetera, in our portfolio compared to basically any comparable portfolio, you would have seen that it's dramatically less. Um, and that's pretty directly the result of that better individual risk assessment on um, that, uh, that, you know, our technology enables. Got it. And I, I guess, um, can you take us a little bit inside or behind the scenes in terms of, I know you've rolled out a couple new products during, during this, this period. Um, how did you prioritize what to launch? And um, I guess, ha has, has COVID impacted your, your product development um, plans? Good question. Um, so when we think about what to build next, um, we are very much, uh, you know, looking to what we think of as sort of the the, the two uh, the two major constituents of our business um, as uh, sort of a what you could think of as a B two B to C sort of business. Um, of course, it's very first important to us to know like what what are the product categories that our actual customers banks um, care about and, and are operating in. Um, and the second question is, where are there opportunities for our technology to really make a big difference in, uh, in uh, the actual financial lives of consumers? Um, and um, when we looked at those particular questions, uh, sort of the first really big candidate was, uh, was auto. Um, auto is a category of loan that um, almost all consumers at some point uh, will have. Um, so it's ubiquitous. Um, almost all banks um, uh, participate in some way in, uh, in auto lending, uh, certainly on uh, all the banks that sort of have a major consumer presence. Um, and, uh, and so that, that's half the story. The other half is, well, how efficient or inefficient is it? Is, are most people who sort of deserve a low rate on this product getting it? And, and the answer is no, not by a long shot. Auto is, uh, is, is sort of a very, um, uh, it's a product with very wide variants in that there's, there's a segment of the population, um, sort of what we call traditional prime folks who would never think twice about, uh, you know, whether uh, it's, it's hard to get an auto loan at a fair price. Um, of course, you know, 
uh, that segment of the population, you know, goes into goes into to a dealership, they pick out the new car that they want, and you know, they can get a rate often in the sort of very low single digits, um, and it works really well. Um, but there's an enormous part of the population um, for whom that's not true, um, and uh, and are actually end up paying uh, you know double digit interest rates on on loans that are actually backed by a car, and uh, and actually. Um, where the data suggests that oftentimes for those people, that car is the last thing that they would stop paying on because they actually need it to get to work, to sort of do other essential things in their lives. Um, and so it suggested that there's this enormous opportunity if you could actually just improve the prediction of who will pay you back, uh, of course, which is exactly what we're uh, uniquely good at, um, that you could get a bunch more people included into sort of the prime uh, financial system, meaning this, the part of the system where they can get much lower interest rates and save a lot of money. Um, so we started doing the work on that. Um, we found that uh, by applying our, uh, our model, uh, which is, you know, which looks at over 1500 uh, factors to better assess the risk uses uh, sort of the latest machine learning algorithms. Um, we, we found that there's, there's about 25 million Americans um, that we could uh, we could we could help in a significant way, and what I mean by that is we could save them an average of uh, sixteen hundred dollars on their auto loans, um, and that's uh, you know for twenty five million people uh, sixteen hundred dollars that's that's a huge sum of money, um, and uh, and so that's what really drew us to that opportunity is big market a lot of people uh, with a real need uh, existing market very inefficient um, and of course uh, you know it can be done through our bank partners uh, for whom auto is an important product yeah that was my next question is that is that a direct uh, consumer product or or or, or is the channel through your bank partners uh, so ultimately the business model for us is always through bank partners because we're really uh, what we're good at is building the technology layer um, uh, the actual uh, sort of remaining all, all the remaining layers of the business, um, you know, we think are best uh, offered actually by banks who have some great advantages in doing that. Um, but uh, as I noted earlier, uh, we do recognize that um, when we get into a new area with, um, you know, bold claims, like there's 25 million people that deserve rates that are that will, you know, end up saving them $1,600. Um, that uh, that requires some proving out. And so uh, for sure, when we start, we will also have a direct consumer component uh, of the business um, that allows us to rapidly iterate, test, uh, and prove um, the, the hypotheses that we have that um, we think are strongly supported by the data. Um, but of course, the case um, to uh, banks is that much stronger when, uh, when we've been doing it and, uh, and can sort of demonstrate uh, the strong performance. That makes sense. And, and, and Paul, in, uh, in May, I think it was, you guys rolled out a, a credit decision API. Can you talk about that product? Um, I guess the development behind it and, um, and, and performance, what you're seeing now. Yeah, absolutely. So um, maybe backing up a little bit for context, uh, the mm -hmm. way we partner with banks uh, in our uh, sort of existing uh, sort of uh, first product, if you will, is uh, is in a white label fashion. Um, what that means is we build the technology layer um, and a bank can uh, actually adopt it and use it for the end to end origination process. Um, they get, you know, their logo, their colors, their branding um, throughout the experience. Uh, but all of the technology, the sort of application flow, the steps, etc, are uh, designed and built uh, by Upstart. Um, that works really well for a lot of bank partners, um, but we, in the process of building that business, realize there are many others who aren't quite ready to make that leap, or perhaps who actually uh, don't prefer to move a, a sort of to an end-to-end -end, uh, upstart built process, um, but do really see the, uh, the, the value of the, um, the sort of upstart um, models and just want to be able to plug those models into a, a sort of consumer facing flow that maybe they've already built, maybe already invested in, um, or, or that they care to own. And, um, and so we wanted uh, to enable that because of course, you know, as you peel back the layers of the onion and you think about what, where are the places where Upstart is adding value, of course, we think that the, the end to end consumer flow is really good, but uh, sort of the central thing that we do that is completely different from uh, sort of the rest of the market is really in uh, in the, the predictive models. And um, and those um, we wanted to be able to surface to our bank partners um, in API format um, that would allow uh, many more banks to uh, to adopt this uh, more quickly across more products. Um, and so 
Uh, so that's why uh, that's why we built the decision uh, API. Um, that's, uh, as you noted, a brand new uh, announcement, and we're just in the early stages of, um, of partnering with uh, uh, some banks on that. Great. And, and I'm asking a lot of questions about um, products, but um, in the remaining time that we have, when you're looking forward, like, do you have anything else in the pipeline? What, do, what are your biggest priorities over the next few months? Yeah, so uh, you know we've got two uh, nascent products um, that uh, that have just come out. So um, definitely a big focus on uh, making sure that those uh, get off to a really strong start. Um, so uh, you know probably uh, no more big product announcements uh, in the next few months. Uh, we're going to be uh, pretty heads down on on these. Um, auto in particular is just an enormous market, um, and of course um, with the credit decision API, we can much more. Uh, sort of flexibly and rapidly move into uh, new classes of consumer credit without uh, necessarily having to build the end-to-end -end flow, which as you can imagine, um, definitely uh, allows us to get uh, to market faster um, with solutions uh, in, uh, in more areas. Um, but I guess I would say in general, um, you know, the, the mission and mandate for us uh, is pretty clear. It's find places where consumers are uh, being underapproved and overcharged for credit, um, uh, and uh, and fix that. And um, uh, and of course, I think that is true across still a lot of categories of consumer credit. So we'll be um, going down the line one by one. Paul, thanks for joining us on the Tearsheet Podcast today. Great, thank you.